not. And I worked for the Indiana Department of Corrections, was a micromanager. I had been functioning on my own as my own boss for almost 20 years before that happened. And it was tough, believe me, very tough. But we all answer to somebody, whether it be the sheriff, whether it be the chief deputy, or the almighty God above, we all answer to somebody. You've got to set your standards. You've got to hold those standards. You've got to know what's going on in your department. And you've got to have people that are loyal to the sheriff. You know, if I get elected to sheriff, one of my questions would be, are you going to be loyal to me or are you going to be loyal to him? Thank you. That's the great thing about it, Lee, though, is, is we're all professionals. If you're the sheriff, they're going to be loyal to you. If I'm sheriff, they're going to be loyal to me. That's, that's the group of guys that we have. I hope so. Anyone else have, have a question? Yes. set plan right now, I'll be honest with you, but I think that's huge. I'm part of our high tech crimes unit. We download phones and laptops. It's a lot of kids and it's it's bad. It's it's here. It's in this community. Parents don't know about it. So that would be one of my my big first things to do is to, to talk to the kids, tell them why it's bad, but also incorporate their parents because Kids almost probably really shouldn't have a phone. Right? The stuff we're seeing is kids just shouldn't have a phone. They can hide everything that their parents don't know about it. Uh, but getting in, getting into the schools is, is a huge deal. It really is. But I, I can't say other than that. I don't know that I have a plan, but that is highly important to me. Lee, did you did you say somebody else? Yeah. Gail, first of all, I want to thank you for your service on the city council, but more importantly, as a teacher. Uh, I think good teachers are very important for our kids. Safety is always a concern for anybody, whether it be a law enforcement officer. You know, we all have children. We all want them to be safe, but we all know that there are predators out there. I think it's vitally important for schools and the chief law enforcement officer of the county to keep an open communication line so they can express what they feel their needs are. If they need more training or more um, insight or 
targeted information towards a particular question that might or problem that might be bothering them at the, thing, at the time concerning children. I think that needs to be brought to the chief law enforcement officer's attention so they can work together as a team to try to address any issues of safety for any of the kids throughout the county. Thank you. Mike. Well, thank you. And that's a great question. And one of the things that I, I've seen and that I know about is there are grants out there to get into the schools and to get some, to teach these kids about safety and everything. And I think that's a, a major thing, a major goal that we need to work on and work with the city and the other governments as well. Because as you know, we have uh, Carroll and, and Delphi, but we also have Rossville and Monticello that kids go to those schools as well. And what we need to do is get down in the schools and talk to these kids and teach them about safety and responsibility and what's out there and what's not. But it's not just computer stuff. There's other dangers out there too. There's, you know, Joe coming up and asking him if he wants to take a hit of drugs or something like that. So there's a lot to it and we need to get people that are trained. And one of them is uh, like, I'm on board of directors for Valley Oaks and, and they do a lot of work with the kids as well inside the schools and stuff like that. And one of the main things is to get get the kids to trust you. Let them, so that they know that they can come to you and trust what they have to say. Because if you break that trust, you're never going to get them to come to you. So that's that's what I think needs to happen. Install some programs, maybe even community policing that get some students involved, even if it's um, just working events. You know, some many different opportunities there that I can see. Who else has questions? <coughs> Michael. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Mike Fincher, Emergency Management Director for the county. Uh, I missed the commissioner's debate because I was in Lafayette, and I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, as you can see it on video. Yeah. Here. yeah. Uh, but my understanding was courthouse security came up. Uh, so I want to get your guys' opinion on courthouse security because Indiana statute requires that sheriffs be present in the courts and maintain the peace with the courts. So I want to get your guys' take on courthouse security. Maybe a little finer question in there, uh, like what would you do? Yeah, what would, you know, something like that. Your idea is securing the courthouse, or okay. how you perceive it. I, every county is different because you know we are one of the remaining three counties in the state of Indiana that does not have security. And who would you be directing to? Uh, let's start with, uh, let me start with Mike. That's one. Okay, that's a great question because. I've been involved in several scuffles at the courthouse myself. I've been there with you. Yeah, and it is needed. We need some uniformed people in the courthouse. And the way I see of, of doing that is we've got to work with our council and commissioners. Uh, one of these days, something bad is going to happen there, and we can't afford to have that happen. Uh, we already had one person put his head through a window, and then we had to, to take that down. So a lot of people don't see that stuff when they go to the courthouse. And uh, there are multiple times when we get called there that we don't know where we're at, or that we know where we're at. They don't know where we're at. And it may take us a while to get there. And it's just not acceptable. We need somebody that's in the courthouse that can respond instantly if we need them. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Uh, People put their head through windows. They've kicked out the jury box. Uh, probation. I, I was sitting in court and remember having to bail over a bunch of chairs because somebody was having an issue back into probation. Uh, probation needs, they call officers in off the road to do portable breath tests. It'd be so much easier if we had a uniformed officer in the courthouse for security and those other other calls that we might need there. Lee? Mike, very good question. Before I answer your question, I want to thank you for what you've done for Carroll County since you've been here. You've got a lot of good equipment. 
tried to head people in the right direction and so forth. I had, a, I had the honor of serving with your dad. He was mayor of Logansport at the same time I was here in Delphi. Back when I was sheriff, of course, we had a larger reserve force, and we had reserve officers assigned to specific courts, and that was part of their responsibility. You know, I mentioned when I first got up here that I had a lot of training. And one of the trainings that I've been involved in is courthouse security that I took from the United States Secret Service and the U.S. Marshal Service. So I know about courthouse security. We do need it. All the courthouses around it have got it. I specifically remember the sheriff over in Howard County getting hurt real bad because a defendant brought a bomb into the courthouse and hurt a lot of people. Everything translates into dollars and cents. I think it's time that we get serious about it. We put together someone or a group of people to start talking to these other counties and see what they use for funding. I don't know whether there's court costs that can be used for something like that, whether the courts would be willing to consider that, or how you get the money. It all boils down to money for positions. But I do believe in courthouse security. I believe there should only be one entrance leading into the courthouse for employees and the public. You know, when I work for DOC, I hate to keep going back to that. One of the things that used to hurt me when I'd go into a prison, and I've been in every prison in the state of Indiana, having been a policeman for 50 years, when I walked in there, I couldn't get into the facility unless I took my shoes off, took any metal off, took my belt off, and be searched not only by a wand, but also by an individual because they're trying to keep stuff out of the prisons. And you know what? They still can't keep it out. But courthouse security is a concern, and it should be a serious concern. Thank you. I'd like to ask a follow-up question to that, and because you all sat through the commissioner's debate. And, oh, you were there? Okay. These guys did. They were kind of not very committal about courthouse security when I asked about courthouse security. So how would you how would you impress upon the commissioners? Because you all agree that you need it. And how would you impress upon the commissioners that you need it? I mean, because there you go, you know? Mike? Well, one of the things is we do have video cameras in the, in the courthouse, so that there are videos of some of the actions that have taken place there. But I think the best way to do it is to sit down and just have a good discussion with all of them and let them know what the dangers are and what is needed to get that done. And, you know, just work with them. Tony, what do you think? Well, yeah, I, I truly don't know how much the commissioners know about, you know, when the jury boxes get broke out or the doors get broken. I, I don't know their involvement. <coughs> We've had people try and jump over the top railing uh, on the third floor coming out of there, out of the courtroom. Uh, so, yeah, just having conversations with them, letting them know these things are going on and hoping that we can get something done before some don't we don't want to be reactive we want to be proactive with it Lee? i'm going to have to agree with chief deputy mike thomas on communications when i was here i expressed or i experienced a, an issue where a Fender tried to jump over the balcony, and thank goodness for one of my reserve officers, he was able to grab the guy by one hand and keep him from falling to the floor. 
I think, you know, the, the commissioners try to provide good services to everybody in the county, and they try to be responsible for all departments in the county, but they can't be experts in every field. And I honestly believe that the council and the commissioners, if they had all the money in the world, that they would fund all the projects that made sense to them for each department. But you know, again, you only have so much money to go around, so you try to prioritize where you think the money should go to benefit the most people. So I don't have a fight to pick with commissioners or council because I, I uh, appreciate all they do. But uh, I think it does boil down to good communication and making everybody understand how important security is at the courthouse. Thank you. Who else has a question? On a little lighter note, I guess, our current sheriff has been dealing with the jail problems and the new jail. And he, to take Ed's words, in each one of your words, what do you say? In one of the three, you get to inherit that problem real quick, uh, working on the new jail. Uh, it's an issue because it's a tremendous amount of tax dollars. And it I just like to see which one. <coughs> All three of you would say where it's going, what you think of it, or what you expect to do with it. Ron, who do you want to answer that first? I will just start with William's workout is fine. You're going to pick on me first. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. I worked for the Indiana Department of Corrections for 10 years. My responsibility was a jail, state jail inspector. And I've been in every jail in the state of Indiana. I've consulted with counties, I've consulted with commissioners, I've attended council and commissioner meetings, not only for Carroll County, but several other counties. There are certain jail standards that have to be followed for the state of Indiana by standards that have been set and I was fortunate enough to be on the last committee that recodified those jail standards and they basically follow the standards of the federal government. The National Institute of Corrections who is recognized as a, an authority when it comes to jails has all kinds of information, including publications for commissioners, council members, anybody that's wanting to build a facility, a new jail, how you lay the groundwork, what your obstacles are gonna be, and how you can overcome those obstacles. You've gotta have somebody that knows jails that's to get involved in the process. And I don't want to sound self-centered or egotistical. When I left Indiana Department of Corrections, I went to work for an architecture company that built jails, built many jails, not only in Indiana. And there's several good companies out there, including the one that Carroll County has currently under contract, Elevatus. But there's also RQAW and DLZ, who I worked for for three years as a jail consultant. It was my job to, I could stand up here and talk about jails for probably three hours. Indiana Department of Correction has a responsibility of approving jail design before, it, it, if, if you had the money to build your jail today, council approved it, commissioners approved it, it would still be three years before that jail was operational. But when they approve that, it has to go to the Indiana Department of Corrections. And those blueprints have to be looked at because there's certain minimum standards that have to be met, not only locally, state, and federal regulations are required. As an example, 20 square feet for an inmate. 
depending on whether it's a dorm style cell block area or an individual cell block area. And that's unencumbered space. If you've got a toilet or a bed, you've got to take that space out. It's unencumbered space. I know jails. There's hardly anything about a jail I don't know something about. And I don't want to, I don't want to come across as egotistical or self-centered or anything like that. But I've been there and I've done it. Thank you. Tony. So was, was the question, you wanted to know our opinion about the new jail? Yeah. Um, your opinion about it and where you're going to take it from here on. Because, like I said, one of three is going to end up with it the way it looks. <clears throat> if we get the whole money for it. So it appears like it's going to happen. There's a meeting, as a matter of fact, the April 18th, I think. Uh, they're going to talk about what all needs to go into the jail, trim some things out to try and make it fit, fit the money. Not a huge fan of having to spend that much money for a new jail, but it is needed. I called over today. We had 47 inmates at our jail, and we're housing 12 at White County. Thank you, Sheriff, I see you up there. We're housing 12 at White County. Uh, I saw an article, I believe that Debbie wrote, talking about the, the level six felonies. Yes, um, possible 10 four. We have five level six felons in our jail currently. And as I understood that law, well, it's gonna be up to the judges whether they go to DOC or not. So I don't think that's gonna affect Carroll County that much. So out of the 47 and 59 inmates that we have to deal with right now, five of them could potentially go to a prison. So I, I don't think that's gonna help us much. But I do know that our jail's 39 years old. It's operated a little differently than St. Elizabeth. St. E, they... Uh, yeah, but uh, those those elderly people in there are trying to tear the place up and figure out how to get out and where can I hide this and stuffing the toilets up. So it's a little different. Like, I, I don't I don't know that it's intentional, but anyway, it, it is different. Uh, our so we have 47 currently. We hold 34, and DOC considers us to be full at 80%, which would be 27. We have, we had to rent an investigation center. We don't have an interview room at the jail. Uh, we have no storage at the jail. The plumbing is falling apart. Electrical can't handle it. So hopefully it's gonna happen. I, I, I don't like that it's gonna happen, but it needs to happen. Yeah, we definitely got to do something with the jail. And from my understanding, something that sounds like is going to be in the process of getting done here. Um, one of the things that concerns me, though, is when we do get a new jail, it's not just the cost of the jail, but you're going to have to have more employees. You're going to have to have a lot of other things. And right now, we're having a hard time getting deputies, jailers, dispatchers, you name it. It's going to be a tough road ahead of us. It's just getting a new jail is not going to be the, the only thing that we're going to have to deal with. The other thing is, is we got to get some mental health into the jail. We got to get those people in there. A lot of them are in there just for drug addiction. They're asking, they're begging for help, and we need to get that kind of help in there to them. Because what happens is, and everybody's probably seen this, if they've got a dog and they keep that dog in a crate all day, what happens when you let that dog out? He goes crazy. And that's the same thing with inmates. They get out and they go, the first thing they want to do, is go party. And we gotta try to break that cycle. And if we can start breaking that cycle and getting getting to people and, and get them the help they need, maybe we won't need such a big jail. But right now, it's needed. Yeah, can I follow up? Sure. 
I heard you ask a question earlier to uh, Commissioner Hilton about doubling the jail staff if you got a new jail. That's not necessarily so. You won't know how much staff you need until you do what they call a data-driven staffing analysis. And it's all encompassing. It takes into consideration how many people you've got working, how many people is going to be off, how many trips you have to make to the court, just a number of, of uh, different aspects, which I've been trained in. But anyway, once a jail hits 80% capacity, you're full. You've got to have a good objective jail classification program in place. It used to be, when I started law enforcement back in the 60s, all you worried about was keeping the men and the women and juveniles separate. It's not that way anymore. Up until about the 1970s, the courts took a hands-off attitude towards criminal justice system when it came to prisons and jails. It's not that way anymore. A jail is going to be built. One way or the other, a jail is going to be built. As Lauren spoke before, federal court gets involved. They're going to come in and they're going to tell you where you're going to build it. And they're going to tell you what you're going to build. They don't want to hear any excuses for money, property, or anything. This is the way it's going to be. You've got to be proactive. You've got to build what you need. This possible fix for jail overcrowding, which is House Bill 1004, is a reversal of what I saw when I went to work for DOC with House Bill 1006. That said that all level six felons was going to be kept locally. I got a call from a jail one day and they said, what kind of effect is this going to have on us? I said, I guess the best answer I can give you is if you've been settled, sending all your D felons or your low-level your low felonies to DOC, you're going to have a backup problem because we're not going to take them anymore. If you've been keeping those offenders, probably not going to impact you. This is just a reversal and it takes effect July 1st. Bill provides that a court may commit a person convicted of a level six felony to the Department of Correction. The current law provides that under certain circumstances, a person convicted of a level six felony may not be committed to the department. There were ways of getting around that if you had an overcrowding part of the problem. I had jail commanders call me and said, man, we've got a problem, can you help us out? Well, due to the fact that I work with all of the directors I could, all, I could place a phone call just to uh, the director of offender movement and say, hey, I've got a jail, it's got a problem. Can we help them out? Sure, we can help them out if they can help us out. It's all about teamwork, working together. I still have those contacts with the Indiana Department of Correction. But we're going to build the jail. Stark County Bill 1, I sat through six hours of testimony involving jail reports and why the numbers changed and whatever and the federal federal court come in there and they were able to resolve it came up with a plan got the lawsuit lawsuit dismissed and they have a fine jail up there it's a very nice jail thank you john newman uh wrote in some questions and they go right with this so i'm going to read one of his questions in part. And he wants to know how you as a candidate uh, intend to accomplish this very serious need, which is a new jail, uh, when no one else has been able to achieve any documented support from either the commissioners or the county council. How are you gonna bring it down? How are you gonna, he wants to know, how are you gonna make it happen? I mean, y'all say you need it, but you know, that started how more than eight years ago. So. Mike? Well, my understanding is that I think that it's probably going to happen now. So, 
there's already a communication line there that's going. We just need to keep it going. We can't let up on it. We can't let it be one of the uh, many items that gets brought up and then it disappears later on. Mm -hmm. So whoever the sheriff is going to be, it's going to have to stay on it. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. So, everyone, just got to keep that line of communication open. The last done thing I understood was it's, it's probably going to happen. So, uh, I think the question may be just a little behind. Probably might be the upper bowl work there. Don't mm -hmm. Tony? Yeah, I think it's going to happen, but I think the sheriff, outgoing, incoming, whoever needs to be involved with with helping with the design of that and what's trimmed out to make sure we get the things that we basically need. Uh, you know, juveniles, how are we going to house juveniles? I think we should, I heard some talk about the, the old jail being a juvenile detention facility. I just don't, I don't see that working. You have to have a totally separate staff for juveniles. We can build a room off the side of off the side of a sally port in the garage and a 20 by 20 room to house juveniles until they get sent somewhere else not long term very short term but like now we don't we have nowhere to put juveniles at the current jail so i just think the outgoing incoming should be a part of all those talks and Well, there again, I think you're going to have to have somebody that sits down with commissioners and council and knows something about jails. You're going to have to sit down and you're going to have to start looking at what size do you really need? What size is it going to take to accommodate the needs of 20 years down the road? There has been projections made for Carroll County based on our population and crime trends on how big a jail and how many cells you need. But I think that can be cut back if you build so that you can expand. But you have to have information. If you're going if you're going to build, let's I'll give you an example. If you're going to build a jail for 75 offenders, you're going to build a kitchen, you gotta have a kitchen, you gotta have laundry, you gotta have all these facilities. But if you're planning on expanding you better build at the time the size for that expansion to come. Because once that facility gets built, you're not going to be able to expand on your laundry room, your kitchen to be able to handle additional offenders. You know, for every action, there's a reaction. And you've got to have somebody that understands that. I think it's all about communications again. Uh, Deb, um, I, I believe like these two gentlemen have said, I think there's a jail going to be built. Hopefully it'll be a jail that everybody can afford to pay for. And hopefully it'll be a jail that'll be well managed and will serve the community and their taxpayer money for a long time to come. Thank you. sheriff's departments around and when you talk to them about that and it's a network that you build the best way to do anything in this world nowadays is to develop a network and get that network done and it, you don't want to just go out there on a limb and try to do something yourself there's a lot of other people that's already done it 
or doing it and you just you, you talk to them you get the experience they need and like I said I've talked to uh, people at Tiffany County Sheriff's Department for instance uh, they are with Valley Oaks they're implementing a lot of new things and I think it's needed and we can benefit from those as well So I'm on a MDT team with uh, Child Protective Services. Uh, get a lot of good information out of those meetings. Uh, a big uh, shoulder, I guess you could say, that I've been talking to a lot is our community corrections. Uh, they have a really good program. I've talked to some of the local attorneys about our community corrections. As a matter of fact, to kind of add to the numbers I talked about with the jail, so the, our community corrections has 61 people in their program right now, today. 18 of those are day reporting, and 43 are home detention. And we talked about the level six felony stuff. Again, the judges are doing a good job of diverting most of those into the community corrections. They have 30 of their 61 are level six felons. Uh, they have all these programs with Valley Oaks and multiple other uh, agencies that they deal with. I would like to see those come into a jail and get the continued care. So they're in our jail, they get these services, and then if they get sentenced to community corrections, they're still with the same people and continue to do the same programs. I currently serve on the Carroll County Community Corrections Board. I've been involved with community corrections for a long time and alternative sentencing programs. Also, I have a daughter that is a therapist for Tippecanoe County and their community corrections program. Like she's coming down here and I think going to throw in a question at us. Hopefully not too tough, but They've worked with the new university, typically New County has. And they're trying to address mental health issues, they're trying to address uh, drug issues, and issues that we don't even think about, like people who still can't read or write. And I think the secret goes back to good communications and Having a leader that's involved in these groups that have issues that want to try to get them addressed. You know, I mentioned before about how important teamwork is. And everybody's in this together. You know, it's not just it's not just the law enforcement. It's you, the general public, it's the schools, it's parents. But we've all got to try to address the issues we've got. But I also think, you know, when I was a young deputy on the road, I never thought about mental health issues. I never thought about drug issues. But what is the real root cause of people going to prison and going to jail? I know that there's people in jail that ought to be in mental health facilities where they can get the treatment they want. The jail has a padded cell to put people in it that are violent, that you can't handle. But you know, I think by the time that somebody gets to where they have to be in a pad and cell, they need to be someplace else where they can get treatment. So I think, that, I think, I think the answer is good communications. Uh, that would be my response. Thank you. Um, I just got uh, an email from Alicia Lee Hall. Start with you. What would you do as sheriff to help get justice and closure for the unsolved double homicides? Well, currently I'm being endorsed by a retired FBI agent. He helped solve sex crimes and he also solved a serial killer in Yosemite. Also being endorsed by Brian Harris, a retired detective from the Houston Police Department. He's had 35 years of police experience. He's been on every national show, investigative stuff. Guess what? They want to come up and help. And they know what they're doing. They're very good at what they do. 
That's the first step I take. There are people out there that really do want to help and have the background to do it and to put forth an investigative team that will get this murder solved. So are you saying that you would change the investigative team? Add to it. Okay, thanks. Tony? There's, there's no monopoly on people that want to come and help with this. We, get, we talk to people all the time. We have brought people in. We are doing things. It's, it's not new. I don't think I'm the smartest guy in the room. I don't have all those years of experience. I've solved a couple homicides, but that doesn't mean if someone, if any one of you could arrest the person, I'll gladly go with you. But those people we've talked to, not necessarily the people Mike's talking about, but there are a dime a dozen retired guys out there that we've talked to that want to come and help. Some people we've brought in. So what would you do? What would you change? What would you, what would you make happen to try to solve this? I would continue the path we're on. We're on a good path. We have people helping us. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's what she, yeah. Lee? First of all, I'm not going to stand up here and second guess anybody that's been involved in this investigation of these two girls here at Delphi. But I think we have to also look at the four girls that died over in Florida. And I keep hearing all the time that, well, that's a state police case. That's a state police case. It's also a case for the chief law enforcement officer in your county, especially if you've had an officer hurt during that process. I'm not an expert. Don't stand up here and pretend to be an expert. But I did too have two double homicides while I was sheriff. About six months after I first took office, I had grandparents killed, assassinated by a grandson. We had that perpetrator in custody within six hours. Six months before I went out of office, I had a double homicide. Grandparents again. Less than six hours that time, we had a perpetrator in custody. How did we do that? We had good cooperation between all agencies. We had good detectives working on the cases. We had teamwork, and we got the mission accomplished. With all due respect to Tony, and all due respect to Kevin Hammond, they were not qualified or trained to accept that responsibility of those two girls that got killed at the time. Now, Tony has a world of experience having worked his case for as long as he has. I know personally and I'm not criticizing any investigator that's been involved in this. But I got involved in it when I still worked for the Indiana Department of Corrections and I was a correctional law enforcement officer during the time that I served there, so I'm pretty up to date on new methods and things like that. DNA, the ability to track cell phones, to get on Twitter, all the other programs that are out there. The dark web that we heard discussed. I've been a private investigator for 20 years. I've utilized all those things, but you know what it comes right down to? Good old fashioned shoe leather. You've gotta make contact with people. You've gotta follow up. You can't sit back and wait for something to come to you that one piece of puzzle that's going to solve that case. You've got to work that case. You know, I've seen flip-flopping going back and forth here. When this case first broke, all I heard was, don't be forming any conclusions by what you're reading or seeing on the internet or on Facebook. 
Now it's flipped over to where if you've had any contact with somebody on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever, please contact us. What is it? What do you want? You can't be flip-flopping on these things. It's going to take a fresh set of eyes and somebody that knows what is going on in these investigations. Thank you. Who else has questions? What? Okay. Back to what Lee was saying, I, I think a new set of eyes is also important. There's many things that have happened in this case that people are confused about. There's been mistakes made, and I'm not criticizing them, but they're there. All of a sudden now, the age, height, weight, all that's been changed. What's supposed to be on there? But it took this many years to find out that that was made up, or that was a mistake. So there's a lot of things that need to be put in place and checked. And I think it's a new set of eyes with experienced people that have been on these kind of crimes before. I'll say something there, Tony. We have the new eyes there. They're working on it, and they're they're both standing here saying that you have to have the shoe leather. We've done that. We've had the FBI involved, Indiana State Police involved. It's not like it was thrown at just being me and Kevin Hammond didn't run out of the gate and, and take the bull by the horns. There were several people that were there in the beginning of this case. There's several people there now, and we're working very hard, I promise you. Anybody else have a question? Going once? Okay. So, yes, I'm Kena Everett. I'm Lee Ward's daughter. Um, and no, he does not know that I was going to ask a question. So, he hasn't been prepped for this. Um, so, we all know with the jail, I'm going to take it down on a lighter note a little bit. Um, we know that the funding for the jail has been a big issue. And some of the information that I'm reading in the paper recently has been about the commissioners talking about if we should look into purchasing buildings for uh, dispatch or coroner, things like that. What is your guys' stance on that or what, what's your thoughts? Um, is that the right way to go when we're trying to build a jail? Um, how do you feel about that? Is it like, should the commissioners be purchasing other buildings when the yes. jail is coming? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know about one of the buildings that was possibly being purchased till recently. Um, we do need some buildings, or we need a place to put them. My question is, if we do get the new jail built, what are we going to do with the old one? Is it a possibility that we could use it for some of these needs that we have instead of going out and buying a, a brand new building or a new place? I don't know. That needs a discussion. Uh, again, communication is what is needed between the council and the commissioners and find out what the best uh, uh, possibilities are for us. Okay. I think in an ideal situation, but again, it, it's a funding issue, we would have some sort of public safety center where everybody's together. The jail, uh, there was talk that there was supposed to be another ambulance garage built in Delphi or for the Delphi ambulance. Uh, the coroner, all that costs money. I don't have the answers to it, but just one big building where everybody's kind of together, separate, but in the same area would, would be a good thing in my opinion. And Lee? Tony, I agree with you. Believe it or not. <laughs> Wait, let me get that down. <laughs> <laughs> Make a big red check on these paperwork over here. You know, I worked out of the old, old jail. One of the oldest jails that I remember, which only had enough room to house about eight prisoners at that time. And I remember moving into the new jail 
which is the old jail now. And when you start separating out all the aspects of operations of jails and law enforcement, especially sheriff's departments, the farther you spread those out, the less communication you have. Communication is a secret. My personal opinion is, I think dispatch, I think the jail, room for the detectives, room for mental health treatment, for programs that you try to set up for the offenders, all need to be in one place. I too, and Bill don't take this personal, and Lauren, please don't take it personal. When we start looking at other buildings, especially one up that I heard, and I don't know whether this is true or not, was gonna run someplace around a little over $200,000. How far that would go to support soft costs for a new jail. Soft costs being things like desks, chairs, other equipment that's needed. And I start thinking about, okay, if we buy this building, what are we gonna do with it? I respect the fact that emergency management needs more space. County coroner needs more space. And I start thinking about remodeling, what that's going to cost. Then I start thinking about, well, it might be a good place to put communication, so you're separating them out again from the sheriff's department. And I'm not saying that because I want to handle my hand and everything that goes on, but I just think any time that you break that down, break down communications, you're losing something. So I guess I'm not in favor of buying a bunch of other bills, but I'm a conservative certainly a person. I don't like spending money that don't have to be spent. I understand Bill's frustration. I've seen him set up there with his head and his hands when it comes to the jail and things of that nature. And quite frankly, I've been quite frustrated about the whole, office, the whole thing myself because I think there should be some people stepping forward and giving some sense of direction for the people that are involved in it. Thank you. Any other questions? So you're talking about the, the naloxone boxes that are out, is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, and public training, so uh, so the public could administer it if there's someone. So yes, naloxone boxes and public training. Yeah. The one thing I wasn't for was the having it in the parks. Uh, if, if people want to go get trained on how to use it, it's actually